Scripture reading for this morning, moving right along, is from the book of Hebrews, chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. If you want to turn there a while. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16. The word of the Lord says this. <clears throat> Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Let's pray. Father, bless your word, bless the reading of it, and bless our time together. Speak to us and change us. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Um, no, sure. We're going to keep things moving here this morning. Um, it, maybe it seems like we've inundated you with a lot of information. You know, the presentation from the Gideons, the presentation from, about sharing hope, a lot of stuff. And basically, what we want to do is we want to be a church that takes the Word of God and lets it affect our lives. We want to be a church that doesn't just sit in here and stew amongst ourselves and be happy with ourselves and has a big party to ourselves without taking the party outside these doors. We need to be a church that reaches the world. And what we're going to talk about today, we're concluding our, our if you want to call it a sermon series, our five-week series on grace and truth with this passage from Hebrews. And the message today is probably going to be a message that you've heard before. And it's probably going to be a message that you could hear almost every week. Because it's a message that's timeless. It's a message that should affect us. But I'm going to start off by showing you a clip from a video that you probably haven't seen before about an experience that I had, my wife had as well, whitewater rafting on the Gully River in West Virginia, southern West Virginia. Um, what they do, um, and I've probably used some of this example before, but they do a, a six-week dam release. And when they do this dam release, uh, the water, and if you've read the middle of your bulletin, it's in there. The water flow of the Gully River goes from about eight to 900 cubic feet per second to usually around anywhere from 2,900 to 3,200 cubic feet per second. And it becomes the seventh best whitewater river in the world to whitewater raft on during gully season. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some clips from a, a rafting trip Laurie and I had. Now, I had clips from another rafting trip that I took that I really wanted to show you, but I couldn't find the DVD. Let me just preface it by saying a couple things. I don't want you to stereotype all people from West Virginia based on the, on the words or the actions of a few of raft guides. Base all raft guides on that because they're just a different breed altogether. And if you've ever been on the river, you know what I'm talking about. But Matt, if you want to go ahead and hit the video while, that would be outstanding. Stand up here watching the video, I'm going like this. I'm kind of leaning, you know, I'm trying to high side with the raft and stuff like that. Oh, man. Our, our guide for that trip was, was named John. Um, and the reason I throw that out is because we had an absolutely wonderful day on the river. It was absolutely outstanding. But I can tell you this one thing for a fact. Had we not had John on the raft with us, had we not had a guide, we would have been in serious, serious trouble. You see, a guide gives instructions for the raft to follow. The guide knows how to read the river. He knows how to read the current. He knows how the rapids flow and how to negotiate through them. He knows where the dangers are in the river are, the hydraulic pour-overs, the sharp, jagged rocks, the undercut rocks that you cannot afford to get pinned in. You see, the guide is important because of their expertise in running the river. But what's fascinating, if you think about it, is even the guide had to run the river for the first time. The guide had to get his start somewhere. The true importance in the guide on your raft lies in their experiences and their expertise. You see, probably my best day on the river, on the Gully River specifically, was a year prior to this video. Our raft guide's name was Richard. Richard was a six foot five, 285 pound, former offensive lineman at the University of West Virginia. When he blew out his knee, he couldn't play football anymore. One of his buddies took him rafting. He went down to that area of West Virginia and never moved back. He became a raft guide. And this guy could put the raft on a dime. 
he could put that raft wherever he wanted it to go. We hardly even had to paddle all day. He was just that good, that big, and that strong. When we entered the day, he said, how do you guys want to go? We said, we want to go as hard and as aggressive as possible. And he got this little smirk where you could just see the corner of his lips pull up. And he was like, all right. And he went over to the other guys. You could see him whispering like, they want me to go hard. We completely flipped the raft three times that day. We took on rapids backwards that other groups were going through forwards. I mean, we did stuff. One time he told us to close our eyes and paddle. And so we're paddling and we're like, what's going on? And we open the eyes and we paddled just into a big boulder in the middle of the river, at which point the raft kind of blew up like a raft bomb and we all went flying in different directions. It was absolutely wonderful and I loved it. But the best rapid, the one that most people look forward to, is called Sweets Falls. It's the last class five rapid on the upper gully. It's the biggest drop. It's a 14 foot drop. It's not like a waterfall you go over, but it's angled at about 60 to 70 degrees. And it's where all the water in the river goes pouring over and it is hard and it is heavy. And it looks relatively easy, not from the intensity point of it, but from the standpoint of it, it looks you have a big area to go through. However, if you don't go through at the exact right spot on Sweets Falls, if you get caught over to the right, you get stuck in something called the Energizer. And the reason I know that is because there was another raft that day. They had a guide on their raft that was literally about the size of my wife. She may have weighed 115 pounds soaking wet. She was just a tiny little thing. And when she got her rapid, to Sweets Falls, or raft to Sweets Falls Rapid, they got too far into the right. They got into what's called the Energizer Hole, and they went over kind of sideways, and when they hit, it kind of popped them up. Three or four of the eight inhabitants of the raft went flying off and came out washed down river, as you see what happens when people get thrown off the raft. But the problem with the Energizer, it, you can't get out of it. It's a hydraulic pour over, and much like we were stuck there, they spent 20 minutes in the Energizer hole. Now the problem with this is at Sweets Falls is where everybody takes out for lunch. Not only the raft company we were with, but the other four raft companies on the river. So if you don't make it over Sweets Falls, if you get stuck in the Energizer, you have about 300 people standing cheering you on during the process. Now I don't say that she was a bad guy because she was a she. It has nothing to do with the fact that she's a female. There are many raft guides that we've seen and had who chew just as much tobacco and are just as good of raft guides in southern West Virginia as the men. It may have had a little something to do with her size, but most of it was her first day as a guide. It was, she had been down the river many times. You have to be to get certified, but it was her first day as a guide. The issue wasn't her physicality, the issue was her experience. You see, it's, it's easier to trust somebody who has more experience in an activity, isn't it? I mean, I, when we used to go hunting up at my friend Clay's cabin up, on the, up by the fin fur and feather, I loved it. I absolutely loved it because his father-in-law who, who built the cabin and his buddy John who built the cabin next to him would come over and the night before deer season, you know what we would do? Absolutely nothing. We would sit there for three or four hours and just listen to Bill and John tell story after story after story after story after story of all the area that they hunted, most of it off the carrier and the hazard road up there. They had a name for every nook, cranny, hollow, tree, bush, according to what had happened there and their experiences. We just listened to them and it was fascinating. But what was crazy to me is Clay's father-in-law, Bill, hadn't hunted there in 20 years. And one day on a Saturday on a whim, he went up about, well, it probably was actually 25. I don't think he hunted there since the early 80s when the hunting was actually good up there, right? And, and he went back on a whim on a Saturday about six years ago. He walked into the woods and harvested an eight-point buck that morning. A guy who hadn't done it in 25 years or so walked right into a spot that we've been trying religiously for five or six years to get something out of, let alone see something, and harvested a buck seemingly out of thin air. Why do I bring that up? What's verse 14 say? Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we possess. Jesus Christ is 
our guide. He has traveled the road that we travel and gone where we cannot yet go. And he is guiding and directing us. You see, it's easy to trust a raft guide who I can look at and I can look at the ferocity of the river and see the dangers and be like, I'm going to do everything this guy says. That is very simple to me because I'm pretty sure my life is in his hands. And I can listen to a guy like Bill talk about hunting when he goes and gets this buck that we've been searching for for years and he goes right to the spot and kills it just that morning. But if we believe that Jesus is who he says he is, that he is the Son of God, then we can have this relationship with Christ as well. Why? Faith is being sure of what we hope for. Faith is being certain of what we do not see. We can read through the words of Scripture, and we can trust that Christ has gone through the heavens and the earth before us, that he was tempted in every way that we are, and yet that he was without sin. That's called faith. But if you have this faith in your life, then it's also called truth. You see, if you believe in the God of the Bible, if you believe in a God that created the heavens and the earth, the God that created everything within them, then you must believe that God created the truth and that truth exists and is subjective to the laws that God created. In the book of Titus, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, Paul opens up by saying, Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. A faith and knowledge resting on the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time. And at his appointed season, he brought his word to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior. Knowledge of the truth leads to godliness. I had an interesting conversation with somebody recently, and they, they made a very astute observation. They made a great point, something I hadn't thought much about before. And what they said was that truth already exists. Scientific discoveries already exist. Mathematical equations that will one day change the world and how we view our universe, and none of us will ever understand because we're not smart enough, already exist. The question is not the existence the question is whether they have yet been discovered. Or another way of putting it is, have they been revealed to us yet? The same question is true for us on a faith level. It's a question as to whether you know it to be true in your life. The answer to this question is one that allows the Holy Spirit to reside within you and will serve to change you from the inside out. But maybe you are struggling with the question that is posed relentlessly to us as followers of Christ in our lives. Why should we trust Christ? The answer is found right there in verse 15. Verse 15 says, We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, and yet was without sin. To me, that's an inspiring verse. That's a verse that gives me life. That's a verse that encourages me. It's helpful for me to know that I am not alone on this journey. Do we know that? Do we know that victory is possible? That the things that may seem so daunting and intimidating in our lives, so impossible to overcome, are overcomable? In fact, not just overcomable, but they have been overcome by the one that we serve. Especially when it comes to the area of temptation. What's Paul write in 1 Corinthians? He says this, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. But God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will make a way out so that you can stand up under it. So often we are faced with unbearable or seemingly unbearable temptation in our lives. We wonder how God could allow these things to happen. How could God possibly expect me to get through this? We focus so much on the problem that we forget the solution. The solution is that Christ already did it. He has already shown us the way. We have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, and yet was without sin. 
And just as I trust my guide, my raft guide, because of his experience on the water, I trust Christ because of his experience on earth. He's not leading from a place that he's never been. He is leading from a place of knowledge. And please understand that I could do a sermon series on how to deal with temptation in our lives. And maybe someday I will, but the simple answer of how to deal with temptation is found in verse 16. Verse 16 says, Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence. This verse does not say that we are to approach the throne with confidence. What does it say? That we are to approach the throne of grace with confidence. Guys, God sits upon a throne of grace. Something that we should already know, but one that we so often, so often, so often take for granted. Do you tend to view God's throne as a throne of grace or as a throne of judgment? Because there's a big difference between the two. If you have a relationship with Christ, if you have a saving faith in Jesus Christ, if you are a believer, then don't approach a throne of judgment. You approach a throne of grace. What's the difference? The throne of judgment says that you are defined by your actions. The throne of judgment says that your sins are punishable in the eyes of God. It views God as being that being sitting on the throne with an itchy trigger finger. The God who's keeping score. The God who wants nothing more than to show you the scorecard at the end and show you how much wrong that you've done. It views God like the old family game Taboo. Do you remember Taboo? You get a card, and you got to get the people on your team to say the word at the top of the card, but there's five words below it that you can't see. And if you've ever played Taboo before, you've heard this noise, right? What's this? This is the buzzer, right? If somebody says one of those five words, you buzz them with that. They get penalized. They have to go to the next card. And if you're watching that person, you are watching those five words religiously. Right? And you can't wait to hit that thing because that's the whole joy of having the buzzer. Sometimes you get so anxious you hit it accidentally and they go, I didn't say anything. And you go, I'm sorry, I guess you have to go to the next card anyway. Is that how you view God's throne? You see, the throne of grace, which we are to approach, is completely different. Because the throne of grace is not something that you approach alone. Jesus Christ goes with you. Jesus Christ goes with you. He intercedes and you come out clean on the other side because of his goodness to you. Do you remember the first time you moved away, whether it was for college, whether it was for job or whatever it was, the first time you moved away, and this work analogy holds a little more water, works better if you had a really good relationship with your family and your parents, and then you went home for Thanksgiving. It's good to go home for Thanksgiving. At least it was for me. You're sitting in college. You can't wait to get home for Thanksgiving. One, because your mother's cooking and not because of college food, right? But it's that feeling. It's that smell. It's that sense that you get when you go into the house. That's the throne of grace. It's that sense of wanting to be there, that sense of desiring to be made complete and together again. But verse 16 also states that how are we supposed to approach the throne of grace? We are to approach the throne of grace with confidence. Do you really think that God doesn't know and understand your struggles? They are not a mystery to him. Does the creator really not understand what he created? You see, if you truly understand this, then you would approach those two thrones differently. Approaching the throne of judgment is something you approach with tension, with apprehension, with timidity. It's like getting called to the principal's office as a student. Or if you watch like these reality shows and they have an elimination round. When people are being called at that, they go in with an excuse. They go in with their guns blazing. They go in to do anything they can to get somebody else in trouble and divert the attention away from themselves. But we're not talking about a throne of judgment. We are talking about a throne of grace. How do you approach a throne of grace? You approach a throne of grace with anticipation. You approach a throne of grace with confidence, with joy, and with comfort. 
You see, you don't have to open your mouth at this meeting because you already have representation in Jesus Christ. If there is any discipline to accept, he has already accepted it for you. He has already proven that he is willing to take it on. If this doesn't cause your love for him to overflow with gratitude, then you need to take a serious look at your faith and start asking what's wrong. Think about it. If you take nothing else away, I want you to think about this. You don't approach the thrones, the throne of judgment or the throne of grace, in different forms because of who you are. The factor of who you are has not changed. Your good, bad, and ugly are still all the same. The sins haven't gotten any darker. The righteousness hasn't gotten any lighter. You approach the thrones differently because of your view of God. You approach it differently because it's a throne of grace and we are commanded to approach it with confidence. So what is your view of God? Is it a view based on grace and truth or is it not? You see, grace and truth tells us that as we approach the throne of grace, we are to approach with confidence so that we may receive mercy to find help and to help us in our time of need. You know, if you're not in a time of need right now, you will be soon. It's a fact of life. In fact, I think it's how the old song from the show went, right? You take the good, you take the bad, you take them both, and there you have the facts of life, the facts of life. I had a great revelation this week. I had a great epiphany this week. Something hit me in a way that it never hit me before. As I was looking a way to close out this message, I was thinking about the bus ride that we had back. Once we got done rafting on the trip I took with our guide, Richard, you have about a 45 minute to an hour bus ride in a school bus through basically ATV trails in West Virginia with a guy you're not sure is licensed and a couple coolers full of beer in the back too. So, I mean, take it for what it's worth, right? I was thinking about our trip back that day because as clients, as rafters, we were ecstatic. We had an awesome day on the river. It was wonderful. It was outstanding. It lived up to all of our hopes. Everything we could have asked for, every one of us was just bubbling about it. But what I noticed on the way back that day was our guide, Richard, six foot five, close to 300 pounds. This mountain of a man was sitting about two seats across the school bus out from me in the front. And Richard was sitting there, and it was crazy because the Pillar Rock Rapid, the first rapid we showed you that day with Richard, we got to a point, it's called the Room of Doom, right? And a raft has never gone into the Room of Doom without flipping. That day, somehow, our raft got into the Room of Doom and didn't flip. Now, myself and another passenger were ejected out of it when he got flipped up and came crashing down on top of me and they kicked me underwater. But the raft itself stayed up and everybody else stayed on the raft. And I didn't think this was a big deal, but the other guides kept coming up to Richard on the way home. Man, I can't believe you pulled that off. That was amazing. How did you do it? What happened? And they kept talking about this the whole way back. And, and then after about 15 minutes, they kind of left and went back to their seats. And they were all just sitting around enjoying the trip back. And I looked at Richard. And Richard was sitting there with just this content look on his face. A look of, it wasn't just a wonderful day for the rafters. It was a wonderful day for the guide. He was basking in the glow of a day that was fully seized. A time that made us all feel really, truly alive. Why do I bring that up? Because I imagine Jesus Christ to be the same way. That was my epiphany. What do you mean? I imagine Jesus Christ desiring for us to put our full trust in him. To put our full trust in his abilities to lead and guide us through life is not just fulfilling our purpose. It's fulfilling Christ's purpose. He came for that very reason, for you to put your trust in Him. If we're not fulfilling that purpose, then we're negating the cross. You see, the message translation writes these verses like this. It says, Now that we know what we have, Jesus, this great high priest, with ready access to God, let's not let it slip through our fingers. We don't have a priest who is out of touch with our reality. He's been through weakness and testing, experienced it all, all but the sin. So let's walk right up to him and get what he is 
what he is so ready to give. Take mercy, accept the help. Help. Grace and truth are a powerful combination and one that is rarely offered in this life and one that is so often taken for granted by us as followers of Christ. Know your guide, know his love for you, and experience the grace that he so freely offers. In doing so, your life will begin to resonate with the old Christian hymn that says, freely you have received, freely give. Go in my name, and because you believe, others will know that I live. What do you truly believe in your life? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for its revelation to us, and I pray that you would continue to be revealed through the pages of this book to us. May our faith be staked on the claim that you are truth, that you love us and care for us, and that you desire us for, to, for us to approach the throne of grace with confidence, not because of who we are, but because of you, you are, who your son is. The fact that he has conquered life on earth without sin, the fact that he has conquered death and the grave, and the truth that he loves us and wants to be used by us. Challenge us this morning, Father. Pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.